Hi, my name is Mikel Samaniego, and I've been pretty fortunate. I've done some pretty cool things in my life. I played professional soccer in Spain, and now I run a nonprofit organization that I'm absolutely passionate about. And if that's all I told you, you'd think I'm like everybody else up here, an overachiever. But the truth is, I'm an overfailure. I fail a lot. I'm not some gifted guy. I'm an average dude with daddy issues. Uh, I drink way too much beer. I'm dead broke. I'm starting to get wrinkles and white hairs. And the hair on my head is determined to relocate on my back. <laughs> Ladies, I'm a catch. <laughs> but that's okay. It's okay to be normal. It's okay to fail. Because I've discovered that if I'm not failing, I'm not trying. And if I'm not trying, I'm not going to do anything that I'm proud of. My whole life, I've tried to do extraordinary things. And as cliche as it sounds, I wanted to change the world. And to be honest, I still do. And I know a lot of people here have that same desire. And so tonight, I want to share some stories of some people who actually are changing the world. And even though I haven't, I think that hearing their stories might inspire you to know that once you decide to do something, and you start doing it, and you keep doing it, then something amazing happens. So tonight I want to talk about three things. First, I want to talk about these two people, Jane and Fred, who are actually changing the world, my failed attempt at doing that, and then also my personal story. So first, we're going to start with Jane. Jane has two beautiful children, Trinity and Tilton. She lives in Kampala, Uganda, and she used to work for Reach the Children. Um, when she worked for Reach the Children, she got to travel all over Uganda, and she noticed one thing, that there were countless deaths that could have been prevented. But for one reason or another, nobody was saying anything. And so suicide remained a silent killer due to social taboo, stigmas, just people weren't saying anything. And one day, Jane had enough. She decided to ask, what if? What if people didn't have to kill themselves? What if there was another way? So one woman just decided and started by herself and going out and talking to people, letting them know that when you're feeling hopeless, that there's another way, that someone cares, that there's something else. And this one woman turned into a team of volunteers. And this team now is the first organization of its kind in Uganda to actually talk about suicide. And they're going out and having dialogues in schools all around Uganda. Jane started just out of a room in her home, and now she has her own office in a hospital in Uganda. And now she's actually been recognized and she's having her talks of hers on national TV in Uganda. Jane's leading a movement, and she's not going to stop. She's going to do it no matter what, and that totally resonates with me. True and lasting change needs to come from within, inspired and led by the community. Jane has changed. Now I want to talk about Fred. I met Fred when I was in Kenya. A friend of mine told me that I had to meet this guy, Mr. Fred. And so when I met Fred, I was actually, I wasn't sure what I was going to think. And I showed up at his school in the middle of nowhere, and they had nothing. But this school was really, really well run. There was just this great vibe. And all the students were really happy. So I was like, Fred, you got to tell me your story. And so he told me that before graduation, he knew what he was going to do. His destiny was really clear. He wanted to go back to his village in rural western Kenya and teach. There were lots of kids, high school age, that weren't going to school just because there wasn't a school nearby. And he said, even though I don't have any money, and I'm just one man, and I don't have a school, I can still teach. So he started teaching. Just a few students at first, but little by little, he's got more students, and the community actually mobilized behind him. And he started teaching in an abandoned building with no doors, no windows, no floors, half a roof. But little by little, he kept pushing on. And the land, that was actually donated to him because people believed in what he was doing. And the whole community pitched in a little bit, just enough so that his students could actually have lunch during the day. And what was just one man and a few students now was a registered secondary school in Kenya. And it's pretty clear. True and lasting change needs to come from within, inspired and led by the community itself. Fred has changed. So I once tried to be like these guys. And I went to Kenya. As you notice, I was wearing a purse. <laughs> um, and I tried to do something, too. I, I wanted to change the world. So during my summer internship of my first year at UCSD, I went to rural Kenya. And we were going to build a school. And I personally led business workshops and a sanitation project called CLTS. 
community-led total sanitation. The goal of CLTS was to go into a community and mobilize them so that they would stop openly defecating. It was a real issue because, since I can follow him, people were actually shitting in their drinking water. It's terrible. But I went out there and I wasn't sure what to do. It was my first time in Africa. All I had was this manual. But you know what? I, I read over it, I studied, and I did it. I went out there and I asked some, some good questions and I had some provocative demonstrations and it hit. The, the community actually mobilized. The village chief came up and outlawed open defecation and the community signed a commitment that they were going to like, create an open defecation free zone starting with building more latrines. And I literally left Kenya feeling like I changed the world. I went back to that same village the next year and on those same rocks where we led the community, where everything transpired. I was standing there, and I was standing in poop. It didn't work. I failed. My project didn't sustain. And I started thinking, and I started comparing my experience, especially with building our school, with the kind of experience that Fred had. We were paying a higher than market rate for the rent. Fred got his land donated. In order to build a school, we needed uh, the contractor, brick, uh, the brick men to, that made the bricks, and then the women to go get waters. And all of these people were paying, or we were paying them more than normal. And so instead of building four classrooms like we needed to do, we only built two. And it became really, really clear. I noticed that, I guess my discovery moment was that true and lasting development needs to come from within, inspired and led by the community itself. I'm not gonna change the world if I go and develop Africa. True and lasting development comes from within, inspired and led by the community itself. So this got me thinking. I was kind of out of the picture. Where do I fit in? What is my piece to this puzzle? And the more I started thinking about it, I started realizing that I had one comparative advantage. It was my access to resources. I could access money that Jane and Fred couldn't have. But I was wondering, how can I leverage my comparative advantage with theirs? So I started questioning my assumptions because I knew that I had the whole picture all wrong. Rather than me going to teach Africans, what if I went and learned from Africans like Jane and Fred? What if, instead of me leading Africans, I went and supported Africans? What if we were playing in the same game and on the same team, but I wasn't a coach and I was a player? What would, everyone ex what would everyone's experience be like? What would my world be like? And you know what? This is actually happening right now. Jane and Fred are changing their communities right now as we speak, but they're not alone. There's people like them everywhere who are literally putting their communities on their back and saying, I'm gonna change this, me. The buck stops with them. When England left East Africa, they took formal education pretty much out of the countries, and the countries suffered. But now, there's a lot of people with formal education, and my best ideas come from some of the people I meet in South Sudan, in Kenya, Uganda. These are the kind of people that are gonna change Kenya and South Sudan. It's not gonna be me just going for a summer. I'm gonna leave. These people aren't. They live there, they're gonna stay there. A lot of people say, well, okay, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. True. But what's the point of me, some white dude, going to teach Africans how to fish when there's already tons of fishermen there and they fish a lot better than I do? And what happens when I teach somebody to fish and then the new fishing pole that I gave them breaks, but I'm back home? We need to have some kind of industry there. There needs to be a, bus a business that's supporting these people. Preview. Um, to be honest, I, I try to put things into perspective for myself. And I was like, okay, what if someone came to me the same way that I'm going over there? So what if my good friend, Mr. Peter, went to Joe Average Laker and was like, you know what, I know the best way that you can get along with your neighbors, blah, 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 blah. How would that guy look? I think he'd look a lot like that. <laughs> so I started thinking, what could I do? How could I fit in? I had an idea, and the more I thought about it, I thought I could do it. And so Angels for Angels was born. Angels for Angels invests in social change. 
uh, working with social entrepreneurs like Jane and Fred to help them scale their social and sustainable projects. And we also work with universities to teach a course in social entrepreneurship. And we help give them resources, and then at the end we sponsor a social design competition. Uh, that way we can get really great ideas out of the classroom and into the community. And we actually just had our first social enterprise design competition in Uganda at Makerere University Business School. And the winner had this really cool idea about a waste management uh, collection business that went through the suburbs of Kampala collecting trash, addressing an obvious market failure. It's pretty awesome. But social entrepreneurship is a very broad field, very vague, very blurry. But I think about it like this. The same way an entrepreneur finds, looks for an opportunity to make some money, and when they do, they do that. Well, a social entrepreneur looks for an opportunity to help their community, and when they find that, they do. I feel like right now Angels for Angels is, an amazing, is in an amazing place because all the pieces to the puzzle seem to be there. Now we can actually connect with these social entrepreneurs. Even though in rural Kenya you don't have electricity, you don't have running water, people still have cell phones and they can still access the internet. It's crazy. But how do we actually work with people like Jane and Fred? Well, with Jane, um, with our help, she was able to start the first ever suicide prevention hotline in Uganda. So when anybody's having any kind of emergency issues, they can call in and get help. They have someone to turn to. And with uh, Fred, we helped him buy and install solar panels so that he can teach classes day and night. And he can be as committed to his students as he wants to be. And we also work with a village bank that gives subsidized loans to widows. There's some amazing people out there, and we're fortunate that we get to work with them. We work with amazing. So obviously you guys can tell I'm super passionate about this. I actually feel like we're on the verge of changing something. I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to change the world. But I can be part of it. I can support the people who are. And I think that hits home here with everybody who wants to change the world. Right now this is going on, and we can all be a part of it. But as passionate as I am about this, I wasn't always that way. And I want to tell you guys my story so that you guys can see the one eternal truth that I've had is just to be unreasonably stubborn. So what did I always want to do? I wanted to be a soccer player. From the moment I could walk, I was chasing a soccer ball. Every single birthday, I blew out my birthday candles wishing I wish I'm a professional soccer player. And everybody supported me when I was younger, but as I got older, people started doubting me. And I'll never forget a really inspiring conversation I had with my dad. And I was like, Dad, my dream is to play professional soccer. And he said, son, if you're good enough, you'd already be playing. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> so anyways, when I was in high school, you know, I still told people I wanted to play pro. People kept doubting me, but I kept with it. And I ended up getting a scholarship to play at Seattle University. And that lasted about a year. I got cut from the team. Only time a scholarship athlete's ever been cut from Seattle University. But you know what? I kept with it. I kept telling people I wanted to play pro because even if I got a thousand no's, I was going to get that one yes. And then I got injured. And that was the closest I've ever been to depression. I didn't have an identity without soccer. I've always been Mikel the soccer player. Now it's just Mikel. But uh, as, as fate would have it, I, I healed. And at the same time, my friend was playing in Romania and said, Mikel, if you come, I'll get you a tryout. I said, absolutely. I flew to Romania, had a tryout, and I sucked. The coach kicked me out of practice, and he gave me a compliment. For someone who doesn't really play soccer, you're pretty good. <laughs> that sucked. <laughs> but um, I kept with it. That whole summer, I kept training. And eventually, I made a team, Petrolum Oynesht. But I was still in school. What do I do? Well, I dropped out of school. It was the easiest decision of my life. That was what I wanted to do. But you know what? I didn't make it because I didn't get my work permit. So I had to go back to school, bust my butt, and eventually, I chased my dream to Brazil. And in Brazil, I made a team, but I didn't get my work permit again. Rather than quit, and rather than say fate is against me, I told me, and I listened to fate, and I said, fate's telling me that I'm almost there. So I kept with it, I went to Spain, my citizenship was going on, and I became a Spanish citizen, and then the work permit wasn't in my way. And I became a professional soccer player, and it was the happiest day of my life. And now I can stand here at a TEDx talk and say, Dad, I made it. <laughs> um, but I wasn't happy. I was consumed with soccer, but it didn't fulfill me. I realized my whole life I'd been chasing soccer and it was selfish. And at that moment, 
I realized that there was more to me. I wanted to play a bigger game, a game with a bigger meaning. And so that's when I started thinking about trying to change the world. And so now I'm using the same passion, the same desire, and investing it in Angels for Angels. And am I failing? Absolutely. I need another 15 minutes to tell you how much we're failing. But you know what? It's an opportunity for me to show how committed I am. And because I'm failing, it's meaning I'm trying. And if I'm trying, then I'm going to make it. So thank you guys very much. And I want to end with one quote. This is from uh, uh, Carolina for Cabrera. This is one of my biggest discoveries that I met traveling. So thank you guys very much.